Welcome everybody to Radicalized Truth Survives. I'm Heidi Kuda. I'm with High Fidelity and Jim Stewartson. We are an investigative show about disinformation and there's a whole lot of disinformation going on. Um, how are you guys? Oh, pretty good. You know, yeah. it's 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 nutty out there. But, oh yeah. You know, what, what else is fucking new? Exactly. Hi, five. <laughs> I'm just enjoying watching the same plot as 2020 with different characters. I know, right? I know, I know. Yeah, exactly. it's like, did we learn nothing? Have we learned nothing? No, no, we didn't. We have very literally zero. Like we actually, have, it's, it's just like, oh, let's let them do it again, but more organized this time. Yeah, right? and actually, to go even a little bit deeper, we're going to be bringing our friend Jack Bryan back on to uh, talk about his new podcast with John Cryer, uh, Lawyers, Guns, and Money. And so, actually, what we're seeing right now is the same plot and the same characters from the 80s. <laughs> I mean, variation on the plot, but a lot of the same characters. So that's going to be fun. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, please, everybody, trust us. This yeah. You really, really need to hear this podcast and, you know, stick around for the interview. Jack's awesome. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I was listening to the bonus episodes last night, and it is so good. And yes, Hi-Fi, I'm like right back in Miami Vice. I'm literally wearing espadils and no socks in my mind. <laughs> All I, right. it, it is so nostalgic as, <laughs> as a is. Gen X 80s kid. Yeah. Like, yeah. you've got Ducky narrating <laughs> yeah. this Miami Vice plot, <laughs> and oh, my God. Yeah, it's so good. It's so good. And uh, but what it really reveals about the players of our times and their desire to overthrow our democracy is is astonishing. So uh, that's a good tease. Let's jump into Front Loaded, guys. Front Loaded. Thanks to uh, one of my dissident friends, uh, originally from Russia. I always get updates on some of the subterfuge and fuckery going on. And he sent me a report about the official Hamas website being hosted, oh, shock, by a Russian company. Uh, according to open sources, the official Hamas port portal is located on the VDN Sina hosting of the hosting technology company servers located in Moscow, a bunch of, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And now, according to uh, the servers, they're no longer uh, hosting this, blah, 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 blah. The reason I say blah, 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 because it just does not shock me at all. And it shouldn't shock anybody. And Jim and Hi-Fi, we have the extremist right wing uh, content in America hosted by uh, either Russian servers or uh, platforms owned by Russians. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, so so 8chan, the you know infamously the worst website on planet Earth, was deplatformed in 2019 after three mass murders were broadcast on that fucking website, the same website that Q lived on, the same website that Pizzagate and Gamergate and all, you know, the the worst parts of the worst psychological operations and cults over the last, you know, seven years, shockingly, or longer than that, have been uh, hosted by the Russians. So it got deplatformed in the United States and then a couple of months later, whoop, Guess what? Pops back up on Russian servers because who's who wants to make sure that the worst possible content, the most traumatic, the most you know radicalizing possible content is available? The fucking Russians. Yeah. Yeah, and also, what do we know about Rumble? Rumble is owned by. Oh, hi. Thanks for checking in. I'm still a piece of garbage. So uh, Peter Thiel is the man who owns Rumble. And in case you don't remember, Peter Thiel uh, does not believe that freedom and democracy are compatible and set up his entire set of companies, including Rumble, to cause maximum possible uh, damage uh, to American democracy. The reason I bring that up, that a, you know, a site that exists to show the worst of us and that really has 
so much Russian propaganda on it, is the official site of the, you know, Republican Party at this point, because that's where they air their debates. And it's like, we just continually, as Jackie Singh says, we continually allow uh, Russia to own more and more of the internet space to our detriment. Yes, indeed. Um, I mean, generally speaking, we have allowed the Russians to infiltrate lots of stuff and we're not doing anything about it. Um, I, yeah. you know, the information space being the, you know, the worst offender at this point. Exactly. Okay. So moving right along, thank you for that gentleman. Um, I was listening to your interview on the Anthony Davis show, which was really, really remarkable. And I was also very impressed with his, uh, depth of knowledge. It was just a great interview all the way around. It did get me thinking though, about something Karen DeWisha said, uh, she was a great, uh, one of the early um, academics who really understood what Putin was up to and reported on it. She was she was really a pioneer in that space here in America. But she once said that, you know, rather than look at uh, Russia as a democracy in the process of failing, we need to see it as an authoritarian system in the process of succeeding. And I bring it up because rather than look at media in America as, you know, as corporate media failing in its coverage of Russia's infiltration into our democracy and the compromised individuals who are giving aid to Russia's ongoing attacks, rather than look at it as a failing, I think what it really is, is a successful cover-up. I think the media has done a very good job of reporting as little as possible on the great information war and Russia's ongoing attacks, and that they're actually succeeding in covering it up because most people continue to be unaware of it. And it's just something that I thought of as I was listening to you. As we get to this point in what is obvious hybrid warfare, I mean, we understand that the connected parts of this war are occurring in Israel, Palestine, and Ukraine, and Russia. And, and, um, and the U.S. with all of the radicalized people doing mass shootings and an insurrection. So don't discount U.S. But yes, I understand what you're saying. There are bombs. The, the, question, and... the question then becomes, are these people merely incompetent or are they complicit? And people really need to start asking that question. Yeah, there's not, it, it isn't a bright line, right? Yeah. I mean, these are just normal people who have pressure at work, they have deadlines, they have all, you know, they're, they're underpaid and overworked and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, so, so, when you get a source, right? And this is the big problem is they get these sources that give them information that's useful to them, that gets them stories, that gets them something to write about. The problem is that those sources, you know, um, are what they're doing is actually covering up for a different crime. Yeah. Right. right. As we will talk about, you know, that's right. With Jack. Yeah. Um, the idea of a, of a limited hangout of putting forward, you know, one story, um, which sounds bad, but is actually just a cover story for the really bad thing that you did. Um, I think there's a lot of that going on in the yeah. press that they don't necessarily internalize, right? It's not necessarily, oh, I'm going to write stuff, you know, that's going to influence us in this particular direction. But, you know, it's the Maggie Haberman, you know, syndrome right where it's like oh i have a source so therefore i'm going to just say everything i can about him without blowing it which yeah. skews the coverage yeah yeah and this has been going on and on and on and it's like why is the headline like this why is you know the washington post doing a headline that ex you know exalts the wrestling prowess of jim jordan <laughs> like what's going on it's that like nah nah it's not that they're failing it's that they're succeeding in covering up how dangerous these times are for democracy right now uh, yeah they call them they call them a relentless wrestler uh you know so i'm sure I, so i i I altered the headline and said uh, that it was a uh, a wrestler abuse enabler. <laughs> nice job. I saw that. Uh, yeah. I, you know, correct the headlines. I mean, that's, uh, uh, that's what everybody when we should, talk about, what everybody when we talk do. about correcting yeah. headlines, when we talk about correcting headlines, I don't understand why you're still talking about Donald Trump as if he's a 
serious candidate for president when yeah. he has been adjudicated a rapist and a fraudster. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Why isn't Who's every time his name points? mentioned? <laughs> That's the problem, right? Well, when your entire policy is owning the libs, I guess a guy like that looks okay to you. I just, you know. It's, there's a, well, there's a, it's not it's not about it's it's they're brainwashed i'm sorry yeah, but i know a third, of, a third of the fucking country is brainwashed you know i mean one of the things that anthony davis and i talked about um you know was how in the hell does 75 million people vote for that after they already know what happened before well because during that period of time they were exposed to so much of this coercive propaganda that they to change their reality to oh he's you know he's he's for us he's going to save the children all of this shit while the normies in the world and every every other country is like what the hell you know and that that's the whole pernicious part of this that yeah. you know, we try and expose is that it's not a voluntary situation here yeah that's exactly right and also i have been noticing that there is older adults who are genuinely confused on where the Eisenhower Republicans went and they genuinely have memory hold the insurrection and they don't understand that there's a group of Republicans in America trying to overthrow democracy. And that is really why I started to think of this cover up. How can they not know? Well, the media is succeeding in not telling them uh, that should be something that's that's pounded every day that these people tried to overthrow our country, but it's not. Instead, it's Kevin McCarthy standing there, you know, on TV and people going, oh, he, he sounds reasonable, you know, like, oh, my God. Um, so that brings me to my last front loaded item, guys. And as I've been putting together the series on the U.S. criminals accelerating global fascism, I realized what is the connective through line with them? Well, it's that they're all waging psychological operations on U.S. citizens. Waging war on U.S. citizens through psychological operations, in my opinion, is the most traitorous act in our history. And I thought about it and I was like Rudy Giuliani waging war against American minds. Uh, Robert Mercer paying for that war to be waged. Uh, Mike Flynn every damn day. Steve Bannon every damn day. Donald Trump every time he opens his mouth. Paul Manafort brought his trick, his bag of tricks from Ukraine here. They're all waging psyops on American minds. And uh, that is why I, I think they're the biggest traitors in our history. One girl's opinion. Uh, well, I mean, I have for, I don't know, two and a half years been saying that Mike Flynn is the worst traitor in American history. And I don't say that lightly. I know. Um, it's it's because you look at what he's done. And in my view, he stole the 2017 elect, uh, 2016 election with Pizzagate, with Russian shit. He helped Snowden, uh, you know, distribute military intelligence documents. He allowed Crimea, uh, Putin to take Crimea when he was head of the DIA. Uh, he started QAnon. He uh, lied to the DOJ that he was cooperating with them. Then he hired Sidney Powell with QAnon money. Bloody blah. Bloody blah. Bloody blah. Bloody blah, bloody blah. It, it, like so. So you know, you look. You just look at what he's done personally, and then you look at the cults that he's generated. Uh, yeah. The connections to the Proud Boys. The all of it. Right. And and it's just warfare. It's straight up warfare that he admitted. He said it was an, an insurgency, irregular warfare at its finest. Irregular warfare is about overthrowing democracy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I feel like we go back to this over and over again in our show. This is without their consent. These Americans didn't say, hey, come infect my brain with your lies. They never gave their consent. No one brainwashes themselves. That's right. That's right. Ever. All right. Nobody All ever right. said, hey, brainwash me, please. No one. Zero people. Didn't happen. And that is front loaded. All right, hi fi. Why it matter? Why does it matter?
matter? Why does it matter? Why high fidelity? First story this week, we're going to talk about spy versus spy. And I'd like to thank the Washington Post for catching up to reporting I've been doing for about two years now about how Russia is waging information war in Africa. Uh, specifically, we talk about uh, Burkina Faso. We've talked about Mali. Um, you know, the fact that Wagner is in eastern Libya uh, working with Eric Prince, I think that would be an indicator to people that perhaps Eric Prince is involved in this global information war that we're seeing. But Africa, um, in populations that are technology poor, information understanding is low, right? Uh, we have that in America. It's the low information voter, right? It is not a uh, it is not a ding on anyone. It is simply that they do not understand the tactics that are being used against them, and these tactics are being used to overthrow governments, both through the information space and physically through arming militaries to uh, engage in coups. And that's why it matters. Yeah, I mean, you you, you um, look at what they do in these countries. Wagner, the, you know, despicable uh, progeny of Blackwater, um, you know, all of these fucking paramilitaries, they, exa exactly, they, there's a two-front war. One is kinetic warfare to destabilize and terrify the, the population, and the other is psychological war. Um, and, you know, they've been doing it for a long time. And speaking of Mr. Eric Prince, Right after this, I'm going to go watch him and Steve Bannon on the Alex Jones show. Oh, God. So, you know, <laughs> yes, uh, Eric Ritz is deeply, deeply aware of all this shit. He is incredibly um, uh, deeply involved in this. So in Eric Prince's defense, that meeting in the Seychelles <laughs> with Kirill Dmitriev, the manager of the Russian Direct Investment Fund, was just a beer among friends, Jim. Well, it's so weird. It's so weird that they just ran into each other in this fucking hotel in the Seychelles. Mm. Who and, and it is imagined? crazy. It is crazy that they had convicted child abuser uh George Nader. Nader. George yeah. Nader. Yeah. 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 So, well, what a small a guy world. Who's in prison all, for these three people. trafficking children. Yeah. A oh, pedophile. I know. Oh, I know. A legit, legit. Like, it's almost legit. like there was a cabal of pedophiles yeah. in the Seychelles. Except it's not who you think it is, right? It's who well, is projected. It's probably yeah. who, who our viewers think it is. But uh, most well, people, mo uh, people on the, you know, out there in, in, you know, La La Land, you know, no. I, I was reading through no some, uh, I was reading through some court docs on Prince um, yesterday, uh, where one of the sources indicated that there was human trafficking afoot um, in his orbit. And that was uh, really not shocking. Um, yeah, an, alas, alas. Okay, so that's that's a that's dark. It's horrible. I am sad because uh, they the Prigozhin, the undearly departed, uh, had moved his Saint Petersburg operation to Africa, hiring locals to do the lying that was going on in Saint Petersburg. And I just feel like, you know, there's just no there's no global defenses against um, this horrible cyber war that we continue to be enmeshed in. And um, economically, uh, people take these jobs to lie and then watch democracies just crumble or go into disarray. Speaking of information warfare, let's move on to our next story. The Russians are in the house. That's right. Apparently, a Russian tycoon, this fellow right here named Magomed Musayev uh, is behind the purchase of the Forbes media conglomerate. Uh, now, the tech investor, a fellow named uh, Austin, swears there's no Russian involvement. However, uh, <laughs> he was spotted uh, at dinner with the Russian and a bunch of Forbes executives. So take that as you will. Um, but we've discussed multiple, multiple times on this program, 
about how you know authoritarians are capturing our media and using that in the information warfare space against us. And uh, here we have another supposed incursion. Um, one must wonder what the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States is doing right now, because it doesn't seem like much. That's well, Hi-Fi, as I tweeted out, I look at it as a lateral move because Steve Forbes is a CNP member and Forbes has been parasitizing, normalizing for some time. I defer to the cover story on Jared Kushner, who was, you know, uh, uh, ex exalted for winning Trump's presidency. So. Mm. Mm. Exactly. It's, it's always been a, it's always been a psyop cannon, right? Uh, it's amazing how many psyop cannons there actually are. Which brings us to our final story this week. Get me to church. I'm failing. Uh, in Ukraine, the Russian Orthodox Church, or as it's known in Ukraine, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Moscow Patriarchate. And for those who don't know, a patriarchate is kind of like the same thing as a Catholic parish. Uh, so Russia is claiming dominion over the Ukrainian church. And the legislature in Ukraine has put forth a bill to limit the activities of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church based on their alliance and support of Russia's illegal war in Ukraine. That well, sounds the, like the, important. Yes, the, Jim. The Russian Orthodox Church is just the KGB. So KGB turned into the F FSB. Um, Kirill, who is the patriarch of, of the Russian Orthodox Church, is literally a former KGB guy who was friends with Vladimir Putin, former KGB guy. The, the Russian Orthodox Church has been, uh, was basically put there as a as a way to uh, satisfy people who wanted a religion in Russia, but it's literally been used as an intelligence gathering yeah. um, organization and as a way to enforce the Kremlin's uh, wishes. It is a neo-fascist, Christo-fascist, yeah. you know, um, operation from operating as an arm of the FSB of the Russian military intelligence. So, uh, you know, uh, all of that shit is just infiltration by the Kremlin into Ukraine, into, you know, Christian, supposedly Christian communities. Um, and, you know, it's very dark and a, a very, you know, exactly what's happening here in a different way. It's, it's scary stuff. And uh, I like to refer to the head of the Russian Orthodox Church as just an old spy and drag. You know, it's uh, it's interesting because I, I listen to, uh, you know, a lot of these American pastors and preachers who are for Trump and everything. And a lot of the things they say, I try to do a little exercise. And with that little exercise, I take their Christian nationalism and I try to put it in a different flavor. And instead of them saying Jesus and God, I think about if they were saying Muhammad and Allah. Um, it would be ISIS propaganda. Wow. Um, if yeah. they were saying, you know, Moses and Israel, it would be uh, extreme Jewish Orthodox propaganda. Um, there's no difference in this base that we're seeing. Uh, it's just different flavors of Abrahamic religion. And that's a problem. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's why Kush is... Uh, thing was called the Abraham Accords, right? It was supposed to get all the Abrahamic religions together, you know, Judaism and, and Islam and Christianity, and solve the peace problem. And if you didn't, if you didn't remember, he solved the peace problem, right? Jared Kushner did, and then he got two billion dollars for solving the peace problem over overseas. You know, where it, the, this, it's all these assholes trying to like move us into some version of the end times so that they can distract us with a bunch of millenarian, like crypto fascist apocalyptic bullshit. while you know, he goes over there and, and does war crimes in Ukraine. 
that's you know that's where that's is all going yeah uh dark and scary stuff which leads us right into hellscape jim stewartson's hellscape oh fuck so i'm gonna keep this relatively short um it's happening um all the stuff that we've been talking about for years um is all happening um we've got russian infiltration into the media R russian infiltration into um the government um and we've got a massive pro-russia death cult in the united states what does that mean right um remember that the whole fiction of QAnon uh, matches the fiction of Christianity, right? QAnon, there's the storm. There's the, the final battle when what happens? All the pedophile Democrats get executed when they're found and executed. That that is the 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 fiction that that QAnon members are you know conditioned to believe. What else are they conditioned to believe? That Democrats are literally trying to come and eat their children. To come, take their kids off the street, put them in a basement somewhere, torture them, and drink their blood. And I'm sorry to be so graphic about this, but it's important to understand. We're taught what we're talking about is blood libel. So, briefly, what is blood libel? Blood libel is the allegation that Jews eat Christian babies. That's literally, if you've heard of blood libel, that's what it is. It's this idea that came up during the Crusades by the way, that said the, the Jews are, are you know, eating their babies and, uh, and drinking their blood. And that rumor turned into QAnon 900 years later. So the, the allegation that Jews were eating babies during the Crusades, which gave, uh, you know, uh, or, or arms of the Catholic Church, like Knights of Malta and Knights Templar, the motivation to go commit slaughter of Jews. And it was not only Muslims in the Crusades. Jews were slaughtered as well. And so blood libel has been kept going for a thousand years, 900 years. You know, it's sort of thought to have started around 1100, 1150. And so 900 years later, what is Pizzagate? Pizzagate is a cabal of Democrats who are coming to eat your kids. And who's leading them? Hillary Clinton or, and or George Soros, her Jewish handler, right? Um, that's that's that ancient lie has been regurgitated and remixed for nearly a millennium the the sort of latest version of it i say latest is the protocols of the elders of zion which was russian propaganda which came from the czars who wanted to have what a scapegoat for all the mistakes that they were making for all the stuff that was going wrong uh, we need a scapegoat there has to be a conspiracy well who should we blame well maybe the same people we've been blaming for three thousand fucking years right but uh, it's always the same scapegoats always the same lies and why 
because it works because it works if we're going to stop that lie from continuing to blossom and bloom like a malignant cancer through the body politic through the mind of of not just americans but the world we have to face we have to face what we're talking about we have to face what we're dealing with which is a lie which is disinformation which is literally 900 year old propaganda think about that they they alleged you know, 1100 that there was a cabal of jews who were eating your babies so i just i just what we're seeing has been done before what happened when who remixed and reused the protocols of the elders of zion and basically incorporated it into his entire reich hitler plagiarized the protocols he said the jews were responsible for losing world war one the jews were responsible for for all and the liberals the jews and the communists were all responsible for um all the problems of weimar germany and what happened it worked he used this 900 year old lie that was remixed by russians um and used it to generate hatred that led to the holocaust think about that same lie 900 years old gets pushed up to 1900 gets remixed remixed and sent back out and leads to the holocaust and now that same lie is being used to generate what hatred against jews again combine that with what putin is doing over there with his buddy as heidi pointed out hamas so when i say guys this is really happening right now mean it the child abuse trauma about kids is the is the single most universal horror fear of parents of people who give a shit and only people who don't give a shit would weaponize that would weaponize people's human emotion, human desire to protect kids. And who is the number one? The number one person who has spread that lie over the last seven, eight years. Arrest Mike Flynn. All right, now we're going to talk about lawyers, guns, and money. It's the new podcast by our friend Jack Bryan, and it's also produced by John Cryer, who narrates it, as Hi-Fi mentioned earlier. Jack Bryan, our viewers will know him from his brilliant documentary, Active Measures. He also was a producer on The Search for Q, another brilliant series. And he also produced and directed the podcast series American PSYOP, telling the story of our friend Wes Clark Jr. And there will be some of that. You will feel an essence of that as you're listening to Lawyers, Guns, and Money. And now let's go ahead and watch the uh, podcast trailer, and then we'll bring in Jack. I step off the plane, and there is a van with a couple guys with Uzis. And one of them in broken English said, welcome to Bogota, John. Join me, John Cryer, for a seven-part podcast miniseries of a true story so incredible, it will challenge everything you think you know about covert operations and presidential misconduct. In 1985, John Mattis was a Miami public defender who was completely unprepared for his first client. 
He was shipping arms into Central America on behalf of the CIA. As a first-time lawyer, I want to act like I know what I'm doing. We'll follow Mattis as he links up with a Colombian drug smuggler. How much money the CIA raised by hitting up drug dealers? A lot of money, millions of dollars. An Alabama mercenary. They were prepared to die to the last man. I saw this in them. I saw the fire in their eyes. And they made me their war chief. And a newly elected senator. We are looking at allegations of drug running, gun smuggling, conspiracy to commit murder and murder itself. He'll fight to free his client. The judge said, show me in a courtroom how we were at war. Expose an illegal war being run by the White House. I mean, I wanted him involved, but I didn't want to be on record as doing it. And somehow stay alive in the process. I just escaped a kidnapping by the CIA in Costa Rica. This is Lawyers, Guns, and Money. So you have a man in an Armani suit standing on the bow of a boat with a rocket launcher and says, if I lose sight of you, I will launch. You will be vaporized. Available everywhere starting October 29th, or get it ad-free and early starting October 22nd at lawyersgunsandmoney.supercast.com. There you'll find bonus episodes along with exclusive content. Subscribe now. Jack Bryan, thank you so much for returning to RadPod. Of course, our friends know you from previous episodes. We've discussed your very important work, Active Measures, very important uh, podcast, American PSYOP. And you are back with Lawyers, Guns, and Money. And before we start getting into some of the micro questions, can you give our viewers like the broad, big picture of what this podcast is about? Absolutely. So it's the story of uh, John Mattis, who in 1985 was a new public defender in Miami, and his first uh, felony defendant was uh, arrested for having a machine gun and a silencer. And he tells uh, John that he has uh, been running guns for the CIA into Central America and that he's protected and that should be fine. You should get off of, of these charges. And so as Mattis starts to investigate, uh, he finds a lot of supporting evidence and gets in contact with the office of John Kerry, who'd just been elected the year before to, to the Senate. Uh, and that starts a Kerry investigation, which starts unraveling a massive conspiracy and a secret war being run by the White House uh, and leads to one of the biggest scandals of the 20th century, but also uh, one of the most successful cover-ups of the 20th century, to the point where we really don't understand that scandal today. And when I first heard the a story from Mattis, probably uh, 2017. It was one of the most shocking, like stories I've ever heard. Uh, I, it was one of the, the a moment where I was just I felt more than any other time. Like, how did I not know about this story? How, how did I not know that this is how this went down? Uh, and it really is amazing. And so I'm I couldn't be more excited to have this come out. It's um, it, it's it's been the most fun thing to work on. Uh, I've ever done. And I think it probably, I mean, if you, if you liked, you know, American PSYOP or Active Measures, it has that element of, of really unwinding a conspiracy, but really this is a story of an investigation, wow. uh, an investigator being pulled into something and finding at the other end, it is a massive conspiracy. Amazing. One thing I want to say to our uh, friends, viewers who have not yet heard the first episode, they just got a chance to see the trailer. It was brilliantly edited, by the way. I love the whole Miami Vice vibe. Um, I, I told you John Cryer is your co-producer on this, and he also narrates. Yeah. I used to be his wife's producer back in the day, which I always think it's so funny that there's always these like, you know, zero degrees of separation. But how did you and John come together to work on this project because it's uh it's not your garden variety podcast by any means. Well, you know, John had been a, a fan of active measures. And so we had been trying to figure out a project to work on. And I had uh, basically been, I had been working on this uh, podcast. And I brought it to him and he heard it and was instantly like, I want to be involved in this in any way I can, because it really is. And, and I mean, listen, I, I, I like to think I did a very good job on it. But it really is one of those things of like, I don't know if there's any chefs out there, but sometimes you really, you get the good ingredients or whatever, and you cook a meal and you're like, I'm not saying I'm a great chef, but this one came out the oven real good. <laughs> <laughs> and 
uh, that's kind of how I feel about this this series. Is it really? Uh, it's it's fun. It's engaging. It's it's the kind of thing that like uh, American Psyop is a perfect thing for me. I love something that's windy, and I really have to like concentrate and get into it and figure it out. But this is the kind of this series is a series that my mom would enjoy and I would enjoy and Jim would enjoy. And I think your audience would also enjoy it, but it's a, it's a lot of fun and it, but it's also a really serious story and it yeah. is a really serious investigation and fascinating one. Oh, it's so heavy. So guys jump in. Um, uh, first of all, Jack, uh, thank you. You've, uh, you've privileged me uh, to hear some of these, uh, some of this uh, early on. Uh, and I've been waiting in anticipation for the rest of it. And now I'm especially uh, more interested. Um, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, there, there will be a lot of relevance to, you know, things that are happening today. Um, I wanted to, to uh, you know, ask you to, to what extent, you know, is there, a, is, is there a connection between then and now? Absolutely. And I think that that was probably the most uh, shocking part of it to me is, is how much it overlaps and how much it relates both in terms of if you want to understand threats to democracy today, this story really helps paint the picture it, that you have. We have some distance from it. And so we can really understand what happened there uh, in a way that sometimes is hard for current events. Uh, and so in certain ways, it very much sets up what's happening today. But then even more directly, <laughs> A lot of the characters, surprising, it's the mid 80s, but a lot of those characters are still incredibly relevant today and relevant for the same very dangerous reasons. Um, because this was an example of a, a scandal that wasn't dealt with, that wasn't mm -hmm. dealt with appropriately. And so a lot of these guys had a very long life afterwards and are still very relevant in a lot of different ways that are very concerning. And I've um, often said that our inability to prosecute and incarcerate high level, highest level criminals in America is not only a national, ongoing national security threat, but it's a global threat. And between yeah. all of your projects, uh, Active Measures, American PSYOP, Search for Q, and uh, Lawyers, Guns and Money, is there like a connective tissue between all of them that, uh, that you can see? Because I can. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a good question. I, I think for me, they all deal with something that is both has two elements for, for me, um, maybe less so the Q one, but but the other ones that there's an, there's an interest, a very interesting story going on and a very important one at the same time that the the inner drama that's happening is is fascinating, but it's also incredibly relevant to a broader political espionage uh, corruption element. Um, but, but you might have a better, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I just see it as ongoing assaults on democracy. Yeah. Wh whether it's coming from foreign enemy states or it's coming from U S traders within, I see it as multiple fronts on the same war of trying to overthrow liberal democracy. I like yours better. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's yeah, that's, that's it. That's the through line. Yes, no, I think it's well, it's funny. It's funny you say that because I think that you know when I got into uh, working in the space uh, in 2017 was really when I started focused very, very directly on this. Uh, you know, it, it really you do have there's so much new information, so many new scenarios that you kind of have to figure out like what is my true north in this, like. Where do I actually hold my, no, this is good. And if we're fighting for that, that is good. Yeah. Uh, and for me, that's democracy. That, that is actual democratic processes. Right. Uh, and that is the place where I sort of uh, shine my light as my sort of true north of, are, are we working towards a more democratic, uh, more open world? Or are we shutting it down and trying to create authoritarian systems? Oh I think God. there's one other theme that I would bring up, which is cover-ups, right? Yeah. Um, one of the one, you know, one of the hardest things about trying to investigate conspiracies is that they the conspira they invent conspiracy theories to cover up the conspiracy, right? Mm -hmm. And yes. so it becomes a it becomes just a web of bullshit versus, you know, a conspiracy that is a 
is just as weird as a bunch of these other conspiracy theories, right? Yeah. And so they weave this whole kind of, you know, disinformation web that you have to sort through in order to get there. And I kind of see that in all of your work, right? Well, I think you're going to, I think you're going to love this one because I'll I'll just tease a little something from like, what if, what if uh, the entire narrative for Iran-Contra of what we, when we think of Iran-Contra, what we think, what if that is a controlled hangout or a limited hangout? (laughs) The entire narrative is just a limited hangout in the Reagan administration. For our viewers, uh, you want to define limited hangout? So limited hangout, which we define in the series uh is a uh, where an intelligence agency or a, you know any agency i guess reveals a piece of information that was previously hidden uh that makes them look bad and so they release that and the press and everybody else goes oh my god look at that and they chase that down but they never look for follow-ups yeah they don't they don't look for to dig deeper because that is the that's the shiny object they were looking for already yeah uh, so can and, I, can I, oh, oh, apologies, go ahead. No, no, no. And so that is uh, something we explore. And again, I think that a lot of the things that seem very strange in the present tense, that seem not likely in the present tense, often with 30 years separation, when you look back, it's like, well, that's obviously what was going on there. Wow. Uh, yeah. So I think that a lot of what we're trying to do with this story is reveal a lot of what is going on today, uh, because... And I think that if I'm going to just sort of spoil a little bit more, I would say thematically what it is, is that the dangers that we're facing right now, we didn't know about them, but they've been around for a long time right? and and longer than we'd like to think that they were. And that what we're facing now is that the end of a long road, not the beginning. And that road really started in the in the 80s. Can can I just bring up one character as I'm making a little bit of a prediction i'm guessing but bill barr shows up to cover up iran contra basically right isn't he mm-hmm. doesn't bill barr show oh, his up? name like, his name might come up in a later episode <laughs> 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 That might be one of a few names that comes up. I'm just, I, I, all I'm saying is that, that he, ended up, he he was, I mean, he, he was he, there. He goes where he's then needed. he shows up in the Trump yeah. administration to cover up a bunch of other shit. Yeah, yeah. He's he not the only in. one. Yeah, we no, know. I, I know. <laughs> And, just, and by the way, just so, so, just for some names, some names I think through it, you know, and, and in addition to the ones that we know, there's a couple where I was like, huh, I didn't know that. Nice. <laughs> there's uh, there's more than you might think in this, uh, in that whole pile. But yes, that is definitely a name that if you listen to the full series, you will hear that name perhaps. Good, yeah. good. And I apologize for any no. spoilers, but no. I, I figured just, just as a, a just threat tea, just, for our viewers. Yeah. Just to think through a little bit. One vein of how things might still be relevant, indeed. High five. So um, I'm a sucker for a good espionage tale. And I I paid for lawyers, guns, and money. And I listened to the first episode. And I listened to the bonus content. And that bonus content, um, absolutely amazing. Just to hear the backstory of of this guy like he was a pothead rabble rouser i love that that's hysterical to me but then the the i don't know how far can i go into the bonus content because it's uh, got some well tease you can, you can tease it but let's let's you know le- le- why don't you ask the to, leading question yeah, ask, ask, ask the leading, leading question, question and I'll, I'll try to the government interest in political action how like there's a little bit of that in the bonus content how much are we going to see of that in the podcast itself we're going to see quite a bit of it uh so this is also what what, so i mean i I feel like i keep going on about what what a great story is but really as a storyteller as we're working with it it was just constantly fun because it's an amazing springboard to talk about really American covert operations over the last last half of the 20th century. And that's in large part what this series ends up being kind of about in a large way is this is the story of the culmination of CIA and covert operations throughout 
the last half of the 20th century. And so that is a huge, so we get into the year of intelligence, uh, 75, where a lot of that came down. Uh, that That's going to come up in a future episode. But yeah, and for the bonus content, I, for me, it was really important to make bonus content that actually is additive and in yeah. that actually contributes and you actually feel like you get something out of it. For me, putting this together, I really wanted the podcast to be tight. My problem with most podcast miniseries is I feel like you get episode one, and that's kind of all the interesting content. And then from then on, it's just sort of devolves. And by episode seven, you can be like, all right, I don't need to hear the rest. Whereas this is very much a story that builds on top of itself and has an amazing climax yeah. uh, and comes together in insane ways. And so I really wanted to keep it tight. And that allowed us to have this amazing extra content that's like, oh, that's fascinating. I didn't know that. But it doesn't exactly, I, I, it'd be too much for the narrative. It, yeah. Dude, you are right. the king of cliffhangers. When I was listening to American PSYOP, I was like, I can't wait till the next episode. Um, I do want to say that uh, it is not uh, without precedent that there is uh, some truth or some information that's revealed in order to do a bigger cover up. That goes back to like James Cagney and White Heat. I'm going to give myself up for this little minimal crime so you don't know that I'm the guy who did the train robbery and murdered a bunch of people. So like that is not at all surprising. What I find is very courageous of you is that you chose to tackle something that has a three letter agency in it, CIA, as people who are always exposing the conspiracies and exposing disinformation. CIA is one of those words like woke now where it's like, oh, they just throw it up there. Epstein, CIA, woke, whatever. And, uh, and to tell a truthful story in this time, we know from Jason Stanley that when the fascist creep is on the march, conspiracy theories are as well, because they need to get people to not believe their eyes and their ears. They need to get people to believe unreality so they don't even question what's true and what's not anymore. So how, like, how much thought did you put into the fact that you know that you're delving into something that deals with a three-letter agency in a time where that is something that is being manipulated in narrative warfare? Well, I, I think that um, I, I didn't really sort of worry about it because it is historical. And it's, like nobody questions that the CIA was involved with Bay of Pigs. You know what I mean? It's not like, that's not a controversial uh, statement. And also I think we try to, I think one of the ways that I try to approach it is we try to be really, um, I don't want to, I, I feel like I'm saying this in a way that's going to, but just very like, not matter of fact, but uh, practical about what this is. Right. And when we talk about the CIA, we're, first of all, one of the things we mentioned is one of the reasons the CIA was invented was to hide the president's hand in covert operations. Yes. Right. Uh, and so oh, people are really fond of saying, well, the CIA did this in Nicaragua, mm -hmm. the CIA did this mm -hmm. in El Salvador. I was like, the president <laughs> ordered the CIA <laughs> that to do that because oh the CIA is is just part of our foreign policy apparatus. You, you, you imagine imagine the CIA is going to do a coup in a country, and the president's like, "Wait a second, we were just negotiating a peace treaty. What are you doing? Uh -huh. That wouldn't work. Like you can't. That's not how that operates." So, uh, a large when somebody says the CIA is doing something, now listen. As we get into, there's rogue operations. There is politicking, a lot of politicking that goes on. So it's not everything's more complicated than one sentence can make it. But if the CIA is doing something really uh, with massive foreign policy implications, you better believe a politician told them to do it. And that politician is the president. So you, you mentioned, you know, having a politician wow. tell them to do it, except we know from the Boland Amendment that what they were doing was completely illegal, contrary to our government's will. Um, how do you handle that in the podcast? Oh, well, I mean, that I, I mean, that is it certainly was an illegal CIA network. So they're basically, I, I mean, there is a rogue network going on here, but it's a rogue network that's being run out of the White House. So it's there. There's basically two ways. I mean, it's again, still a rogue network, but the CIA for me isn't the headline. The headline is the CIA's boss was running the operation. Uh, and you, and it wasn't just the CIA, it was the NSC. It was, you know, it was, uh, it was a lot of different, um, uh, it was different, you know, agencies and it was retired, you know, generals and it was, uh, militia members and it was Miami Cubans. And so it was this whole hodgepodge, but, and yeah, CIA, I'm not, I'm not sitting here being like the CIA has never done anything wrong and they're all great and da, 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 da. 
But for me, who is the top ranking guy? And that's the guy where the responsibility lies first and foremost. Boom. Jim. Uh, I'm just curious uh, about uh, William Casey, uh, sure. who was, you know, Reagan CIA director until he sort of, I guess, mis a little bit mysteriously died in 1984. Yeah, uh, he, he had brain cancer for a day. Yeah, that's weird. No, I, I actually, I have, and I, by the way, I have no idea. No, no, I, no, no, I, no, no. We're, yeah, we're yeah, just no. being facetious. <laughs> this is the thing that was joked about at the we're, time. That, we're like, being oh, facetious. Just, but, no, 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 but it was, I'm, I am too, but I just, I, for, for the record, I, I, I have no evidence that, that Casey was assassinated. He probably had brain cancer. I have no idea. I, 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 I'm not going to study of that. Yeah. But yeah. Well, he's a but he's a really interesting guy to me. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, he's very interesting. Because he he first of all he founded the Manhattan Institute. Mm -hmm. The Manhattan Institute is now Chris Rufo and CRT and grooming all of those narratives yeah. come yeah. right out of the Manhattan yeah. Institute, you know, which was started by Reagan's CIA director, also William Case and Casey. campaign manager. Oh, right. Yes. <laughs> William Casey was also, uh, and this is also interesting to me, a Knight of Malta. Mm -hmm. He was uh, a, a member of the Sovereign Order of the Military Order of Malta, um, which has a, a very, very dark history, including supporting Hitler during World War II um, and is still uh, in, in operation, in, in my view, as a, as a very dark sort of force including Eric Prince, um, who, you know, shows up uh, obviously a lot in these days. I was just curious to what to what extent Casey uh, kind of fits in, because he's he's early on. So hopefully not too many spoilers there. But, you yeah, know, uh, we, we, we don't we don't get into the Knights of Malta stuff. I mean, I, I think that no, he not Knights of Malta necessarily. Yeah, but just Casey. Casey in general. He's a because. He, he, yeah, he, yeah, there's a lot of con converging lines on that guy. Yeah, K Casey is a, is a very uh, interesting character. You know, he started off in OSS, which was the precursor to the CIA, and he was actually a Sing Singlob's case officer there. Jack uh, Singlob. Yeah. Yes. Um, but uh, and so and he is not really a member of the intelligence community for a while after that until he becomes Reagan's campaign manager and then becomes head of the CIA. Uh, oh my and God. And so I, he is uh, certainly character. I think the Knights of Malta stuff is, um, I, and I have not done as enough of a deep dive on that stuff as I probably should have. Um, but I think that that is a, a thread that is uh, very conservative, uh, you know, intelligence guys. It's not uncommon. It's, you know, there's a, I think that there are these, yeah, obviously, I think more than I think, they're, they're social networks, you know, yeah. and, yep. and exactly. very, um, often tight, sometimes loose, but, but there are social networks and, you know, common thinking and very conservative and, um, you know, uh, people conservative are, is a, is a very nice way of to yeah. it. And nutty. I mean, that's the other thing is that like, I think that we, everybody wants to think that people in power aren't nutty. And it's like, listen, we all know people who are forget that these guys, just broadly speaking, we all know guys that are great at their jobs who are yeah. crazy at everything else. Right. Uh, so you can have a high power job and think that a bowl of spaghetti runs the universe. Like it's there's nothing yeah. that makes that impossible. So, yeah, a lot of these guys have very strange beliefs and are part of really weird little organizations. And I think that stuff probably does drive them more. than We'd like to think that they do. Right. I, I'm writing a series called American Monster, and I I look at somebody like Roy Cohn, who was involved in getting Reagan elected and involved in introducing Rupert Murdoch into the White House. And I'm looking at that Reagan administration as a freaking cesspool uh, that led to so much of what we're seeing today. And I don't think that that has been fairly examined. And I'm very grateful that you do much of that in this podcast. I want to say, speaking of nutty, uh, the superb propagandist known as Donald J. Trump uh, wrote on his uh, bullshit platform today about how General Mike Flynn was very unfairly treated. He was an innocent man, unlike other innocent people <laughs> being per persecuted by this now fascist government. And I'm honored to give him a full pardon. I bring that up because A, Ruth ben -Giot, says Trump is a superb propagandist. And B, if he says Flynn is an innocent man, that's as good as an indictment. And C, I believe that the pardons in this country, 
the pardon fraud that's occurred, the pardon, the pardoning of Nixon, the pardoning during Iran Contra, I believe that that has led to this true crisis in our democracy right now. And the pardon fraud that's been perpetuated on our country has allowed criminals to continue to try to overthrow our democracy. Any thoughts on that? I, I agree. I mean, I think that uh, pardon powers of the president are really silly. And I think that, you know, I mean, listen, I, I, I think that uh, on one hand, I, I think that the obviously we have to uphold the Constitution and we have to maintain it and preserve it and fight for it. But I think there's also like we can't keep being kid gloves with the Constitution. Like there's like, hey, guys, this is a document that legalized slavery. All right. If you yes. want to say that you think the Constitution is a God written inspired yeah. thing. You are blaming God for slavery, yeah. right? I, you know, that's, he might not like that. Yeah. Uh, so we have to, there are things that are part of our constitutional process that are not great ideas. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that we have to do two things is one is we kind of have to re-examine a lot of the things that are very, like when Madison was writing the constitution, he had to ask Thomas Jefferson to send him books from Paris about Rome because he didn't know how governments were organized. Yeah. They didn't know how to do anything. Uh, and that's not their fault. They didn't have access to anything. <laughs> so, uh, you know. It was pretty think, miraculous given the circumstances, right? Yeah. It's, but, it's good. Yeah, it was good. To, and I think that it's, I think the amazing thing about America, it was the document. promise, the, the document. For me, I, I think to the, the from a, a progressive way to look at America from a patriotic angle is it is a, a goal. It is a promise that we will make this country more free continuously yeah. and if we use the, uh, const the, the the revolution as a starting point for that, like I start the clock, now it's about extending rights, and that is our goal. And now we've extended rights to you know laying down a white men, and it does it continues. And every twenty years, it goes out further. You know, twenty years after the Constitution, you don't need to be land owning to be the white man who votes. Uh, you know, then you don't vote for representatives, you vote directly. And so the, the, I think we should be more comfortable with the process of augmenting some of these things. And while we are doing that, being very dedicated to what is there now, we need to uphold and fight for completely and really do that. But we used to change the constitution all the time. It didn't bother yeah. people. Well, and the difference now is that we have criminals who've been stress testing it from every single angle. And if we don't get the deep structural reforms that we need, we will not have a democracy because 100%. these criminals are exploiting the vulnerabilities in that document. Hi fi. Yeah. yeah. And, and I sorry, and I think that if 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 the series uh Lawyers Guns and Money is about one thing though, really it is about how that system came apart to an extent, how, how that democratic process started to bend. Uh, and it really is the prequel to where we are today. Oh my God. Um, so I'm trying to put, you know, I'm trying to put this podcast in my head in kind of a chronological timeline. So We've got Watergate and we've got Nixon and we've got the break-ins, right? Mm -hmm. We have the Iranian hostage ordeal in which, you know, closed ordeals were made to keep the hostages so Reagan got elected. Then we have Iran-Contra. You, might, you might, right? might hear a little bit about that as well. Oh, <laughs> interesting. You might. You might, you might hear uh, quite a bit about that, in fact. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't see a lot. Uh, I was afraid to, to, to ask you about we, that. We, we go talking, for it in this but... one. Like this is not. There's no punches pulled in this one. This is. Uh, yeah. We, yeah. <laughs> oh, it just. I, I see these these dirty tricks being pulled every decade, five years, fifteen years, twenty years. I mean, we look at the election of two thousand and the Brook Brothers riot. Dirty trick, right? I mean, what was January 6th? I mean, it was an attempt to coup, but it was ultimately a dirty trick. The big lie, dirty trick. When are people going to wrap their heads around? Uh, it's 2016, dirty trick. There's another one I mean, you haven't, you guys haven't mentioned. And it, if you want to know what it is. Is it 9-11? Tell me it's 9-11. No, it's another, another election. No? Another election where a very... Another election? Oh, Bush v. Gore? Bush v. Gore. Mm-mm. 
before last half of the 20th century. I, I, I'm not, I, I, this is a tease for the audience. This is a tease. This is a tease. No spoilers. It's in the last 50 years. Um, well, we'll around 50 years. I'm, I'm not doing the math in my head right now, but, but give or take. Not, uh, Nix, not Nixon uh, delaying peace talks in Vietnam uh, because he was super I'm worried saying, about getting I'm elected. Saying, I'm not saying. Oh, not I, just, I nailed it. Saying. I nailed it. I nailed <laughs> it. Oh, my. oh man. Me girl, giving up, really, giving the girl, show away. Girl, give the story away here. History. No, we're not. There's going to be so much good stuff in it. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, uh, and again, is there anything you can tease about related to uh military defectives uh in terms in, term, in terms of, like, i thought you were saying mean? defectors Defect well, defectors about, or defectives anything you can tease def, well i i can say that in episode two uh you meet a character who is uh the kind a kind of person within the intelligence community that you kind of hear about in rumor and hear this kind of thing happens but i'll bet nobody has actually heard the story of somebody who went through this process wow i'm so excited holy crap holy crap is right so, holy crap is right uh, i i i have a, a a totally unrelated question right. um uh, if you don't mind, please, please, please. Um, uh, it relates to American PSYOP please. Um, and uh, what you uncovered about I am um, and, you know, the that kind of cult, um, the their um, influence on Wes Clark Jr. Sure. Um, Mike Flynn recently has been going crazy trying to portray himself literally as archangel michael mm. um i mean he he had a a consecration for uh, for Arch archangel michael with bishop strickland and stuff yeah, i'm curious if if that yeah. sort of perfectly like, normal <laughs> a cult uh, like like a cult christo fascist like theme um from you know uh you know, because there was all that Fort Bragg shit, or you know, in, so, in 1980, he, all of that stuff. It all seems to kind of flow in there uh, without giving anything away. I'm just curious if that yes, uh, and I flows th through. So, uh, yeah, yes, and I mean, yes. no, in the sense of we don't do the new ageism, um, right? And uh, for for me, the most interesting thing I found out about, and I wish I knew this before I made uh, American Psyop was how much uh, the oil and gas lobby had been financing the New Age movement throughout the 70s yeah. and 80s today yes. uh, as yeah. a all for global warming concerns. Yeah. Um, but wow. uh, but in this, what we, well, I can tease one thing that we go into. So one of the things that we sort of say that a lot of this set up was uh, it's sort of a post-Vietnam War syndrome. And if you don't know, Vietnam War syndrome was post-Vietnam, the uh, army went into a serious rut because they were the first American soldiers to lose a war. Yeah. And it became this alternative narrative that Washington lost it. It wasn't the military. And I guess you could say that the war was a faulty from the beginning. So that was Washington's oh, yeah. decision, fine. But that's yeah. not how they meant it. <laughs> they meant that Washington was just too, you know, pussyfooting around. Uh, and um, so that turning into a sus thinking that the communists, the communist threat comes from Washington not from overseas and what that idea of that communist threat becomes after the fall of the wall. Uh, and that plays very much into that narrative and is a very important um, piece of that puzzle. Uh, cool. And we definitely go into that. Yeah, absolutely. That is a huge part of this narrative threat. Uh, awesome. Thank you for that tease. Wow. What I was looking for. <laughs> High five. All right. So you got a lot of uh, what I would call astroturf criticism on American PSYOP. Oh, this is fake. This isn't real. Wesley's a fraud, blah, 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 all these things, right? Yeah. Um, now we're getting into espionage and conspiracy and things that aren't documented well. 
Um, how, how do we get people to understand that this is conspiratorial because it was, in fact, a conspiracy? <laughs> so here's, here's the great thing about this story. Okay, Here's the thing I love most about it. Everything was reported. The successful oh. cover-up wasn't that it didn't get reported. It was just on page 17 of the New York Times on a Saturday. Okay. Uh, so it's all documented. That's what's crazy about it. It's not It's not that it happened. It's how well documented all of it is. Wow. Uh, with videos, uh, audio interviews, like so much archive uh, interviews. Like most of what we're playing is, is an interview with Mattis or archive interviews. Yeah. Uh, and it's all out there. And that's the, I mean, I think that there was an element, I don't know if it was a pre-internet thing, but like, it is amazing how much of this information was reported. I mean, again, not front page New York Times for some reason, but it's, and that's, I think for, for me, that's the trick is that you can see the entire thing going on 40 years ago. You have that level of disconnection where it's not like, you're not being told every day it's baloney. You can see it very well documented. You can see how it happened. You can hear from the people involved. You can, the entire narrative. And, and because this is about an investigation, it is very much, how do, does Washington cover something up? What is the way that they do that? How do they shut people down? Uh, and so by seeing it from afar, we can then apply it to the modern world and it fits like perfectly. Wow, wow. Uh, a lot of these characters continually resurface in my investigations, like Newt Gingrich and people like that. And I bring him up because Nixon in a peak helped launch the right wing fuckery media industry that we know of today. And they have done an incredible job of obfuscating truth, an incredible job of always playing the victim he literally birthed the right-wing disinformation machine. And a lot of brave reporters at that time, a handful of them, really were trying to break through the Iran-Contra. They were trying to break the Iran-Contra story, and they did. And they were attacked, and they suffered. And when you take on this type of work, do you do that understanding how, uh, how fierce and well-financed the pushback has always been? Absolutely. I mean, I, I do these projects because I find them fascinating. Like I couldn't th have thought of a more fun way to spend the last two years than putting together this project. The, right. the, the interviews were amazing. The, every time I would do research, I would find some, just stumble upon some fascinating thread and either we could include it or we could. And I was just enjoying, you know, learning about it. Wow. Uh, and so I, you know, I, I enjoy making them and I, I try to craft them so that they will facilitate a really enjoyable experience in listening to them. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if, if, if there's good, I, I assume there's going to be maybe not less on this one, but I think that, the, yeah, there's people astroturfing and criticizing me and da, da, da. And that's, you know, people have the right to criticize. Like, that's fine. Like, uh, I, I want people to feel passionate about it. You know what I mean? So if they're passionate and they're like, screw this, I hate this, uh, that's that's okay. Like, and I think there's a lot of people who are like, this is liberal bullshit. I, I'm a conservative. Great, be conservative, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think that that's the thing with being on social media is you have to accept that everybody, almost everybody's going to have a different perspective than you. And like, yeah, I don't like being criticized. I don't think anybody yeah. does. But like, uh, that's that comes with the territory, and you know, uh, at least they're talking about it. I've released things that nobody saw. That's that's more painful. Wow. <laughs> but it's just crickets. Where it's like, ah, I mean, I, I, wrote, I, did, I directed a scripted movie, you know, almost probably ten years ago now, and uh, yeah, it did not. It came out, and you know, people didn't really see it. Well, Indy, that's that's worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I feel like authentic criticism is one thing. These yeah. these paid operatives and these these uh, campaigns to Hillary people is something different. And and what but, what, but, what, yeah, what I, well, I was going to say what what Nixon came up with. And I just I just again because you're bringing up history, mm -hmm. I have a quote from Haldeman here where he says the president was convinced that the press and TV don't change their attitude unless you hurt them. Nixon was never one to miss a chance to screw his enemies. Uh, 
with br brutal, vicious attacks. And I feel like that's just infected our world. It's like we used to be able to sort of agree to disagree. And now it's all like Roger Stone, well, Nixon. Yeah, but we, sure. But I think that we, we used to be able to have conversations in our own private spaces, right? Like, yeah. you know, every people treat Twitter like it's them having a conversation with a friend. <laughs> I've always looked at it like this is, I wouldn't say it on Twitter if I wouldn't say it on TV. Yeah. Like right. you are broadcasting. Yeah. <laughs> you are not having yeah. a conversation. You are broadcasting. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I, I don't have any expectation for people to not be crazy people on Twitter, you know, or, yeah. or, or crazy people anywhere else. And I think that that's not to say I'm not like this is irresponsible and this is bad on mass and this affects yeah. people negatively and we should do things about this. But for my personal sake, like, yeah, I mean, people on Twitter could be nutty. That's, that's, <laughs> they wouldn't, I mean, you know, that's, that's what, what it's there for. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Like, Word. High five. <laughs> All right. So I have, uh, for quite some time now felt that the network behind Trump and January 6th extends back. You know, we, we've discussed it on this show. We've discussed the history of J six with Dave Troy. Um, but there's three names that I think a lot of people forget about. And there are three names that I think people need to remember, especially with regards to what's going on. And those are Gary Webb, Danny Casolaro, and Michael Hastings. And all three of those journalists, there's a lot of shadows and smoke and mirrors. But ultimately, what I'd like to say is investigating this network in one way or another, led to their deaths. And it just seems like this is a very dangerous network to have operating in the United States. Um, do you feel that there should be some sort of Senate inquiry or lawsuits or something to shut down this type of behavior that there you talk about in your was. podcast? There that's, was. That's, that, that is the thing that like, what if I told you there were televised Senate hearings on CIA gun drug running in the uh, late 80s and early 90s before Gary Webb? Wow. And Mic drop. Mic drop. Listen to the series. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it's oh. about. <laughs> <Boom>. <laughs> and that's a wrap. <laughs> oh my god really that is that really is that's everything i think we teased as much out of you as we're gonna get yeah i think we got um, as much we squeezed them <laughs> nice nice freaking way to go deep and dark hi-fi i would expect no less from you um before we let you go because we're so excited i can't wait to listen uh to the bonus material um is there anything that you can uh, tell our viewers, um, you know, basically like not to be afraid to examine like the hard truths of our country uh, Absolutely. So, so we can move better, move forward better? Absolutely. And for me, at the end of the day, this is also uh, this series really is a love letter to people who investigate this stuff. Um, uh, that's that's what it's about. And that's. Uh, it's about the struggle of doing that and what you lose, but in the end, what is gained? Um, and that it is, it is a real struggle. And we all know that we all face the criticisms and we all face the, the hard times of it and the self doubt. Um, mm -hmm. And it is about all that. Um, and it is about one of the greatest investigate. I mean, certainly the greatest investigation I've ever uncovered or heard about, or let's looked into uh, and how it fits in and how it, echoes uh what is going on today is is truly shocking but it's also a fun ride it's also really fun <laughs> it's miami vice it's miami I, vice meets all the president's men it does it's a whole like fun thing yeah 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 man we'll all right just one, think... one final question I'm yeah not, i'm not gonna hold you to it i'm not gonna put you on the spot but uh sure. but i'm gonna put you on the uh, spot here right now <laughs> which which means i'm totally putting you on the spot <laughs> but i noticed that john mattis is out there on twitter and uh, mm -hmm. I was wondering, since you've spoken with him, mm -hmm. uh, can you extend an invitation to him from oh, us? Sure. To oh, he'd love that. Come on the show. Oh, and here's a here's a fun little little teaser. So, in the 1980s, Robert Redford was going to do this story as his follow up to All the President's Men. Oh shit! 
but the climax had not happened yet. And they wrote, I mean, they had a screenplay, they were pitching it, but it just, it, it does, the story doesn't culminate until two years after that process was going through. So it, I mean, I'm not the only one sitting here being like, holy shit, this is an amazing story. Like wow. this, this was going to be the, the next All the President's Men in, in the 80s. Awesome. And, well, and may, maybe, maybe once this sto the story has come out, we can talk to, to John about it. That would be amazing. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah no, he, he would love to. He would love to. It's a good talk. Awesome. Yeah. Lawyers, Guns and Money, not just a Warren Zevon song. It is now a podcast by John Cryer and Jack A. Bryan. Uh, check it Fun out. And Fun <laughs> and shocking. Fun and shocking. And informative on what is happening today with many of the same players. And I think that is very, very critical. Jack, we thank you for your work, for your bravery, for coming on to our little show. We are always so honored to have you here. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. I'm John Cryer, and this is Lawyers, Guns, and Money. It's the early 1980s and Miami is the United States' biggest hub for narcotics transportation from Central and South America. 70% of all the marijuana and cocaine coming into America passes through South Florida. This is the era of the cocaine cowboys. They call them the cocaine cowboys. Yesterday, they struck busy Dadeland shopping mall shortly after two, spraying the parking lot with bullets. The Miami-Columbian connection is 80% of a $20 billion annual cocaine business. The drug trade touches every part of life in Miami. Sam Smith was a Florida judge until the FBI caught him selling marijuana. In Miami, one third of the Dade County Homicide Squad is under indictment for protecting a major drug dealer. And the state's top law enforcement officer is wondering who's running the state, the government or the drug smugglers. And as drug money pours in, Miami booms. According to experts at the Organized Crime Bureau of the Dade County Public Safety Department, Drug smuggling through South Florida may well be the state's most profitable enterprise. And with the drugs come guns, making Miami the murder capital of America as well. The murder rate has shot up 70 percent. The head of Miami's Police Benevolent Association has warned that the criminal justice system can no longer protect the public. Now, if you're looking for a rundown of what gangs and cartels were in power at what time, there are a bunch of really good documentaries, books, and films on this topic. Uh, Scarface is about Miami during this period. But this story is different. This is the story of what happens when that world of Scarface and cocaine and arms smuggling collides with the White House. 